Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. Alex is letting me fly solo today. I really don't know what the cause of this madness is. And we are going to go full Athos, Porthos and Aramis on you because we are talking about the myth and reality of the Musketeers. I am joined by effectively the guy from the internet, as he sometimes likes to be called, everyone's favourite ponytail historian, the blogger, historian and master of adventures in Historyland, Josh Proven. Josh, how are you doing? Um, I'm doing very well, thank you for that generous introduction, as always. This is obviously why I, obviously why I come on History Hack, just to just soak up the, the adulation. You can't see right now. It's a very regal wave you gave there. I know, you can't see me now, ladies and gentlemen, but I did a very regal wave uh, at being uh, referred to as Master of Adventures in History Land. You didn't even look slightly smug, not at all, no. (laughs) Let's get this out of the way then. Out of Athos, Porthos, Aramis, and I'll throw D'Artagnan in there, just, just for you. Which of the musketeers are you? I... And you have to take a turn at this as well, if you want to. But this is the game. Uh, I am... Um, okay, I don't know if other people see me as this or not, or what, but I identify with Aramis. I, I wanted to be Aramis. Any particular reason why Anna, Aramis and not, I don't know, D'Artagnan? Um, or... Okay, so well, it, it, we'll get to the you know my first introduction to the Musketeers at some point later, but without giving too much of the rest of the conversation away, um, uh, D'Artagnan annoyed me when I first saw him uh, on screen. Um, I only got to like him when I read the book, and I didn't see myself in Athos, who is. Uh, deeply troubled character, <laughs> uh, and I didn't see myself in Portos, who is just an extreme, extraordinarily confident, uh, muscular kind of guy. Aramis is quieter; he's much more thoughtful. I don't think I'm the Lothario type, which I can't, I don't really identify with. Which he is sort of spun as the romantic lead of the, uh, alongside D'Artagnan, I suppose. But, uh, yeah, I also also really like the idea that he constantly wants to get out of the Musketeers and become a priest. I thought that was... I just thought he was a fascinating guy. Fair as well as being deadly with a sword. Yeah, see, this is the trouble with me. I'm not deadly with a sword. Uh, I also would confidently predict that I'm a rubbish shot. So on both counts, being a Musketeer probably isn't for life for me. I don't know if that suddenly makes me, by default, the the incompetent king or the hapless um, kind of peasant. I'm probably not evil <laughs> enough to be Richelieu. So, um, are, you, are, you, are you putting in for the job of uh, of D'Artagnan's servant, Blanchet? <laughs> pretty much. I, I, think that's, I think that's all that's available to me. I am Blanchet. <laughs> there were other act in the book. There are other servants as well. Athos's servant is actually quite capable. Uh, <laughs> Now, this wouldn't be History Hack if we didn't stop for a moment and discuss our first encounters with the Musketeers. Everyone knows about the Three Musketeers, hopefully. Um, So what was your first exposure to them? Did you do the novels first, or did you do the films first? It was the films first. Um, uh, To the best of my knowledge, um, my first exposure to the Musketeers would possibly have been a recorded videotape VHS time, people, uh, which has been recorded from TV by one of the grown-ups. Um, uh, of the, it was of the 1974 um, Richard Lester movie, uh, um, The Four Musketeers, which is actually a sequel. And I didn't read the book until I was a teenager, uh, but I, I loved it. And uh, when I did, and to this day, to be honest, it, it is probably my favourite classic um, novel. I mean, I do talk about the fact that another favourite of mine is War and Peace, but The Musketeers is is still probably my favourite because Dumas is all about the story, uh, and it's it's just it's just brilliant, it's just brilliantly done. See, for me, I think my first encounter with the concept of all for one and one for all was the Animals of Farthingwood, which isn't quite the <laughs> same thing. <laughs> Well, that is, that's fascinating. I watched the Animals of, Scar- of, of Farthingwood and was 
you know, psychologically scarred by mm -hmm. some of the stuff that went on in it. Absolutely. But, yeah. <laughs> so which for you is the best interpretation, either in terms of honesty to the novels or in terms of historical accuracy? Which do you like the most out of the films? Mm. Well, I haven't seen them all. I mean, but, I mean, in terms of the question, it is it is a tough call. Because I mean, uh, how, how do you how do you choose between Mickey and the Three Musketeers and Dog Tanyon? I mean, obviously those are the top of the the cream of the crop. Uh, such a shame they never made a Muppets version. That would have been that would have been that's that instantly been. going to number one, isn't it? There it we go. Have. Yeah. All we need to do but now is put together a TV pitch and obviously a finder's yes. and We'll make tons of money. There we go. We will. The, the, the Muppets need to do the Musketeers. I mean, they did Treasure Island, and that was that's the best pirate movie, so obviously. <laughs> anyway, um, despite how fun the cartoons and stuff are, uh, um, it's, uh, it's quite, it is quite hard because of the amount of remakes there have been. Um, one author joked that it's uh, easier to pick the years there hasn't been a Musketeers film made, or a Dumas uh, adaptation. Um, uh, but I've, so I've seen the 70s ones, and I've seen the 90s one uh, with the interesting casting, and uh, some of the other ones as well. Uh, I've also seen the recent um, BBC uh, TV reboot. Yes. Um, generally speaking, I think that the 70s movies are closer in spirit to the book, aside from personal preference, because that was the first one I saw, and a lot of people will have the same feelings about the later ones um, their fa as their favourites, because that was the first one they saw when they were you know, like younger. Um, and others might today prefer the you know the modern biker gang slash special forces hybrid thing the BBC did, um, which is essentially a, a totally different story. But I, I do think. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't think there is another interpretation out there that does such a good job of transferring the book to screen as the 70s ones uh, with, uh, and it's, it's and the, yeah, a really great cast. You had like Oliver Reed, Michael York, Richard Chamberlain, Albert Finney, um, Faye Dunaway, Raquel Welsh, and Charlton Heston and Christopher Lee, and if that's not a dream cast. team, yeah, I, I don't know what it is. Uh, written by George MacDonald Fraser, so it's actually quite funny and outrageous as well. And accuracy-wise, um, I think the, the uniforms are actually probably more accurate in the 90s, but there's a lot to like it in terms of look and feel about the 70s ones as well. Yeah, see, the, the first film that I saw was that 20, was it 2011 one with Logan Lerman, where yeah. they effectively strapped the Mary Rose to the Hindenburg <laughs> and then attempt to blow up Orlando Bloom in the Tower of London. That was genuinely the plot line. If you don't believe me, go away and watch it. So for the folks who, who think that is the story of the Three Musketeers, break it down for them. What's the original story by Dumas about? The original story was, was seri serialised by Alexandre Dumas' père during the 1840s. It's actually historical, historical fiction, if that makes sense. You know, he's he's writing about the 17th century, so this is uh, a great example of what, in quotes, you know, romance writing used to be before Mills and Boom. Um, it centers around the adventures of a young Gascon musketeer cadet named D'Artagnan. I don't remember, to be honest, if we ever learn his first name. Um, and his three musketeer friends, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis, uh, during the reign of Louis the Thirteenth of France. Um, there are sequels to the Three Musketeers. Uh, Twenty years after, where you get a couple of new characters, and then the uh, Comte de Bragelon, uh much later. Uh, technically, it tells the story of D'Artagnan's life. Um, but the first book, the famous book, the classic one uh, that we all know of. Um, the core part of The Three Musketeers, which you see in the better screen uh, interpretations as well, um, uh, the heart of the story is formed uh, so that you see the characters develop as they go on secret missions for the Queen of France and dual powerful enemies who work for Cardinal Richelieu. Um, at its core, it's about friendship, loyalty, and chivalry. 
um, and is re really so influential, to be honest, when it comes to um, uh, the perception and, and making of, of action in swashbucklers in both written and filmed mediums, I think. And I mean, who isn't moved by the concept of all for one and one for all? Absolutely. And the, the, the big kind of pinnacle of tension across the whole thing, if I've got this right, is the Queen is accused of spying and it falls upon the musketeers to mm. travel to London, recover a piece of jewellery um, and return it before um, the deadline of a ball where the king has kind of asked her mm. to wear this jewellery as, as a test to see has mm. she um, been responsible for having an affair? Is she spying? Is, is there subterfuge going on here? Yeah, that is, that is, that is the great movie part of the book, which is which sensible um, movie makers take out of it. There, it is it's a, it's a, it's an 1840s book, so there's actually more in it than that. But that is the core of it. The the Queen of France, uh, Anne of Austria. Confusingly, she's not Austrian. She's of the Spanish. She's Spanish of the Austrian house. Uh, she's Spanish then, Habsburg, as opposed to yeah. Austrian Habsburg. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so that's a little confusing, but nevertheless, um, she has has had an affair with the Duke of Buckingham, uh, who is the, the Prime Minister of England, it, I believe, in the book anyway. Um, and uh, she's given him a, 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 a present, a, a token uh, of some very, very expensive diamonds that um, <laughs> the king gave her. The Cardinal Richelieu finds out about this as he does, and he wants to shame the Queen, and because she doesn't like him and he doesn't like her. And uh, but yeah, she she calls upon the Musketeers to go and get the diamonds back. In a way, they're the Queen's Musketeers, to be honest, because they're always kind of trying to get the Queen out of a bad situation, um, where, which you know is very chivalrous of them, and. Um, they're just ordinary guys trying to get make their way in the world, to be honest. Uh, the book paints it, and they get into these extraordinary circumstances because they're in the Musketeers, and that's, those are the guys the, the kings and queens of France go to when they're in trouble. Absolutely. So how do we get to Dumas and the Three Musketeers? How, how are the, the actual Musketeers formed, and what, uh, what is their purpose? Right. So in, in 1622... King Louis XIII reorganized his father's old corps of uh, Carbonier, uh, which is, inter is an interesting name. I believe it refers to rifle. Um, and I think that might mean that this old unit carried some kind of rifle, but I'm not completely certain. Um, but he armed them with muskets, which uh, people are a little confused about because theoretically that's a less effective weapon, but maybe in 1622 it was actually more reliable, I don't know. Um, so he arms them with muskets, and in so doing, effectively creates a new corps within the elite body of the, um, the, the Maison Militaire de la Maison du Roi. Um, which, and the first creation of the King's Musketeers was quite small. The company numbered as only 100 men, and in many ways was more typical of the types of bodyguards um, uh, bodyguard units that all important men in France were entitled to maintain at the time. They were disbanded in the 1630s uh, after King uh, after, after Louis XIII died, and there was a power struggle uh, kind of over who would then command the musketeers. Captain Treville was a real guy, and because he didn't want to give up the musketeers to Cardinal to a relative of Cardinal Mazarin. Um, uh, they were just disbanded because he wouldn't step down. And then they were reformed, and Cardinal Mazarin appointed his, uh, his like, nephew or something uh, to the command anyway. Um, anyway, uh, so they're back in the 1650s, and a second company is added in uh, the 1670s, which was Cardinal Mazarin's old company of guards. Uh, so in a way, some of Cardinal Richelieu's old guardsmen might have ended up as musketeers in the 1670s. And interestingly, you tell the difference between them because the first company of musketeers rode grey horses and the second company of musketeers rode black horses and so you got the grey musketeers and the black musketeers.
Interesting. Uh, was there a kind of a rivalry between the two in terms of seniority? Um, sort of, yes. Uh, by the, by the, certainly by the time of Louis the Fourteenth, because there's a great story about how his, I think it was his grandson, the Duke of Burgundy, uh, one of his relatives anyway, his younger relatives, wanted to be a musketeer. And word got around to the musketeer companies that one of the king's close relatives wanted to be a musketeer. And so the two musketeer companies started to get antsy with each other about outperforming each other and like brawling with each other about who was going to get the Duke of Burgundy. And Louis XIV basically was delighted by the fact this in a way because it made <laughs> meant he got to play Solomon. And instead, but it, he, he, he so valued his musketeers that he didn't want to offend either one. So what he did was he had two uniforms made for his, for his grandson um, uh, so he could alternate between both companies and therefore not offend neither one. Well, he's rich. It's what rich people do, isn't yeah, it? If you've I got know. to make a difficult decision, just throw money at it. Have two uniforms. <laughs> Be captain of both. Why not? Yeah, why not? So, so there are 100 men, as, as mm -hmm. you say, a single company to start off with. In the grand scheme of things, that's not a particularly big number. So are these elite troops for their day in terms of training, or is it the idea just you have a, a large enough number that if they're hanging around, they would put off an assassin? I, I personally think it's a bit of both. Um, the first thing to remember is that French kings did seem to get a fair bit of get into a fair bit of trouble and downright danger. Um, in the in the 15th century, where you start to get these guard units uh, appearing, not the musketeers, but guard units in general for the king, uh, it became essential to have a royal bodyguard for the monarch because um, he often went to war and the French kings apparently seemed to get quite stuck in uh, when they were present on the field. Uh, for instance, Charles VIII was saved from capture by his guards at the Battle of Fort Novo, um, and the 100-strong Swiss guard died to a man trying to protect Francis I at the Battle of, of Pavia in 1525. Most importantly for the musketeers, though, Louis XIII's father, Henry IV had already survived two assassination attempts when in 1610 he was knifed by an assassin while sitting in his coach. Um, the musketeers' principal purpose, therefore, was in quotes to be on guard when the king goes out, and then they march two by two in front of all the other guards. So they took actual precedence over the more senior guard regiments whenever he left the palace. As a result, of that, um, you get this kind of double life for the musketeers, where they are very important as a, a small, dedicated bodyguard unit, but also one that is trained in an interesting combat role as well, which we, we can, we'll get to later. So what are they doing day to day? Are they sort of these people who are on guard duty? Clearly it's not a ceremonial role from what you've said. They actually are there to kill somebody if somebody uh, makes an attempt on the king's life what what do they have to do are they the people who are posted at the doors or does that go to somebody who's less well trained right, yeah well that uh, speaks to a kind of the organization a little of, of the of the royal guards which will kept become clear as as we go forward but the Royal Guard was split in two, with essentially with those who guarded outside and those who guarded inside the palace. And the musketeers were amongst the outer guards. Uh, they were responsible, as we've said, for the uh, uh, security of the king and of the palace, but also for exterior palace security. And as time went on, uh, amongst those who regularly, um, uh, the musketeers actually became, uh, uh, what would be the word? The principal amongst the principal people who would uh, regularly see the king um, in the margins of the day. So um, a musketeer actually waited on the king the first thing in the morning and last thing at night to ensure his majesty's well-being and that he had no business that needed attending to before before um, retiring for the day. Because remember, the king by this point uh, was captain of the musketeers, and that and and 
the person who actively commanded them was a captain lieutenant. Um, and so, the, yeah, the, uh, a musketeer would be one of the first people to see the king in the morning. In the in the uh, in the uh, you know. um, and when the king went to war, obviously, uh, which he regularly did, the camp of the musketeers was always very close, and they had a special role in combat, being able to act as a mounted and a dismounted force. Apart from that, guarding duties and stuff, they um, they train a lot in, in riding and um, uh, some theoretical aspects of science and the art of war, foot drills, the handling of arms. Uh, again, the, the captain of the musketeers is literally the king after a point, sir, and especially under Louis XIV, uh, who, who actually inspected them once a year. Uh, they had, so they had to be superbly conditioned, uh, ready to, to, to perform uh, in, in, in their ceremonial role, in their bodyguard role, or combat role, if need be. And um, the day to day duties would also include, like, you know, obviously mounting guards and escort, escorts for various people, messenger duties, um, the, the interior, um, what's it called, the interior. Uh, Economy of the of the company or the in, in quotes regiment um, uh, could be exemplified by the routine duties of again mounting picket guards and caring for weapons and routine drills and things like that. But there was an interesting there was an interesting uh, thing I found that in day to day duties also included the mounting of um, a stable guard, uh, where a small rotating detachment sought the security and the well being of the company's horses. And everybody in the musketeers had to do this at some point, no matter who they were. There were also the secret political missions that they would be sent on having a unit, because having a unit of expert swordsmen and riders at hand was just useful for resolving intrigues and arresting and intimidating political enemies, or just entrusting them as secret carriers. Um, the high level of devotion within the musketeers to the crown all which ensured discretion, and even Richelieu's successor, um, uh, Cardinal Mazarin, put musketeers to use for a number of uh, confidential missions. So, I mean, you, you touched on this already because you mentioned about how they are kind of devoted to the king, but presumably there's quite a significant amount of discretion involved if these men are going to be physically close to the king. They are going to overhear matters of state, um, potentially quite sensitive issues. So, how was their loyalty assured? Their, their loyalty was assured because they were drawn from the ranks of the lesser nobility and gentry, generally people who could just about pay to be a royal guard. And we'll get to, the, I guess, the, the nuts and bolts of that a little later. But what that does is the king is offering his patronage um, to people who would not normally have a place in in high society, and therefore, if you owe, ev therefore you owe everything about your position in life now to the king, and the life of a royal guard is pretty good, to be honest. Uh, it gives you access to the court. Uh, they are mostly all gentlemen, so they can interact with a certain level of people, and they're respected as as um, as, the, as a type of elite soldiers as well. So this. This idea of offering patronage in, t in return for service is obviously not new, but it is a very effective way of assuring loyalty uh, to your person, especially uh, because they owe no loyalty to anybody else but the king as a result. See, this is interesting because you've also mentioned that they aren't the only bodyguard unit. So I'm curious to ask you about the Cardinal's Guard and the rivalry that exists, but at the same time, you've also mentioned that the cardinals sometimes send the musketeers off on duty. So how explain that complex mix of different individuals kind of leaning I mean, on them. Yeah, I mean, it's probably also a good point as well to explain a little about the Royal Guard itself um, in, in, in party to that, because obviously, as I said before, the cardinals, one of the cardinals iterations of the Guard ended up becoming a musketeer company. Uh, so famously, Cardinal Richelieu had a, had a guard unit. It was actually the largest guard unit, um, personal guard unit, uh, in France at the time, 
because Colonel Richard was also almost assassinated once and uh, the king decided to expand his protection. Meanwhile, the Musketeers were only one part of a very impressive organizational structure, which, which grew and grew and grew. As I said, they were raised in 1622 as the most junior element of the, uh, the military household of the royal household, i.e. the Maison Militaire de la Maison de Bois, and they would remain as such until 1676. It is implied they were senior to the infantry of the guard because they had a mounted role and they were made up of gentlemen, even though the guard infantry were formed in the 1560s, so older. Um, the Maison Militaire uh, or, uh, was one of the oldest in Europe, and by the 17th century were amongst the best established in terms of the prestige and traditions associated with them. England, for instance, had no royal guard to speak of until the late 17th century, uh, where, and, and the French ones were amongst the, yeah, just the best established in terms of prestige and tradition, definitely, I think, uh, except for some Swiss units, I think, hanging around the Pope. Uh, even, even, and even the French king had a Swiss guard, so... That there's no, you can't compete with the Swiss for traditions of guarding important people. The most senior, as I said, were the cavalry, the oldest of which was the first company of the Garde du Corps, which was known as the Garde de Corse, because they were formed in 1440 from Scottish soldiers of fortune in French service. The Garde Francais were the infantry formed in the 1560s, with a Swiss guard added uh, by Louis XIII in 1616, as a result, by the 1600s, the Garde du Corps was the most senior of the Garde regiments, followed by the Gendarmes de la Garde, the Chevaliers de la Garde, the Mousquetaires de la Garde, uh, and they followed these troops in seniority. And after them, the infantry, the Garde Francais, the expansion of the household troops under Louis XIV from 1676 to the Grenadier de Cheval de la Garde, as well as the Grand Reserve of the Gendarmerie de France. You see what I mean about the ridiculous, the just ridiculous size of this of this organization. This is making uh, my head hurt. If I'm being really <laughs> honest with you. And this speaks to what you were talking about before about the duties of guarding doors and stuff, because there was the Sant Suisses, which is the hundred Swiss who were palace guards, right? And then there's the Guards de la Porte, who are door guards. <laughs> uh, so there are ceremonial interior palace guards as well as large bodies of, of, of like essentially combat and protective troops outside. Um, and uh, uh, the units, the, I mean, the, and, the, and within them you get special detachments of men like that single musketeer who sees the king at the beginning and the end of the day. In the Garde du Corps, there was a special team of guys called the, the Garde de la Manche, or the, the guards of the sleeve, because they walked so close to the king that they brushed his sleeve. And there was at least two of them always around him, even when he was at prayer. So, and, and you have to understand something about the way things worked as, things, as, as the institution of Versailles and stuff came to, into being, about how regulated the king's life was, uh, and, and all the traditions that sort of flowed into it. Now, that gives you a, an idea of where the musketeers sit, right? They're right in the middle, but ridiculously close. And as I said before, they're very useful because they're a little bit more scrappy than the other guards, right? They're exterior palace guards. They're, they're diehard loyal to the king. They're the souls of discretion. And then you have the personal guards of Cardinal Richelieu. And in the 1620s, those, the musketeers and the cardinal's guards are the two most visible, and they feel, two most important guard units in France. And there already you have bang-on collision, so it gets, you know, a bit hairy. And uh, I'm happy to say, and a little sad to say at the same time, that the rivalry you get between the musketeers and the cardinal's guards is 100% real. It did actually happen. And um, the, the secret mission element of the Musketeers just so happened to be seen as incredibly useful by people like Cardinal uh, Mazarin, uh, who succeeded Cardinal Richelieu, 
um, as head of state after the death of, uh, after both uh, he and um, Louis XIII died. Um, and Mazarin is known for having, a, I mean, I know one example, but I don't know the details of the story very well. He actually used a real D'Artagnan. Now, D'Artagnan was actually a real guy, Charles Bass de Castelmore, Comte d'Artagnan, oh, who became captain lieutenant of the Musketeers, and died at the siege of Maastricht in, I think it's 1671, um, but I'm a little unsure on that. I'm sorry if I got it wrong. Standing next to the Duke of Monmouth and the future Duke of Marlborough. Isn't it they, funny how all of these things coalesce? Uh, but he, he, he was actually used in, in that period where the Musketeers had been disbanded by Cardinal Mazarin for several secret missions and uh, arresting some, some people, but enemies of the state and stuff like that, because the, he was a Musketeer, and the Musketeers were known to be, by this point, as just dependable guys who would do what you asked them to do in the, in the name of the state. So the rivalry between the Musketeers and the Cardinal's Guards, how serious does it get? Because you have duels that happen. Are, are these just kind of arguments that get out of hand and they have little scraps? Is it more like the 18th century kind of honour-based private duel? Or is it a little bit more kind of sinister and mafia-esque in nature? I'd say that it's kind of a mix between the first two um, because it got very serious and like I say, um, these two guard units felt that they were both re the most important, and that was essentially the crux of the argument, uh, because the Cardinal Richelieu is the effective political master of France's destiny, and you know, the most, but theoretically the most important person in the kingdom is the king. So you have these two kind of ones technically, you know, one's more important than the other for different reasons. Um, uh, by the 1620s, of course, as well, you know, <laughs> dueling has is, is been banned by Edict of Cardinal Richelieu. So you can't, kind, you can't really do the 18th century thing, even though it was still banned by that point. But you, you can't really be doing that. Um, but they didn't really stop it, uh, the, the rivalry, which obviously got so serious that literally they were fighting each other about it. Um, and the reason it didn't stop was because, again, these are the king's musketeers and the cardinal's guards, the two most important men in France. Both um, security forces are basically untouchable because of who their bosses are. Uh, this allowed the cardinal's men and the musketeers to conduct their rivalry in full view, though it was generally an informal matter. You know, by this time, a, a simple cat call from a musketeer to a guardsman was enough to see swords drawn in the street. And, and gangs of the two units would, would set to at the sight of each other sometimes. Um, and the cardinal and the king secretly enjoyed hearing if their side had won in the latest brawl and let it go on despite being totally illegal. Is that a power play between the two of them? Because you, you <laughs> sort of talk about how they enjoy it. Are they sort of, I don't want to use the phrase getting off on, on the <laughs> kind of the hype of it because that sounds a bit weird. Um, but... You know what I, I'm saying? Are they kind of enjoying, in a slightly sadistic way, that oh, I've got one up on you because my musketeers won the last three rounds? Yeah. Is that I, is that happening? I think so, to be honest. I mean, you have. I mean, one would have to read a lot more about the characters of the two guys, I think, to be sure. But I think that's a. I think that's definitely a thing. <laughs> and in terms of staying with that power politics thing, you've got the cardinal who has a guard. You've got the king who has a guard. Is that not quite dangerous for the king in terms of the power politics? You know, you've got these two incredibly powerful individuals who, in effect, are sort of jockeying a little bit for position in terms of who really controls the country and who doesn't, who is the symbolic head. Surely that's quite a threat to the king and the king's person. Yeah, you'd think so, based on the whole Roman tradition of, you know, good personal guards bumping off their bosses and stuff like that, or being used to assassinate people. But um, I guess at this point, the, the crown is in a kind of ever-strengthening position in France, and, and the personal guards of these men tended to be drawn from guys who, like we said before, have a vested interest in keeping their patron and effective benefactor alive. The musketeers, for example, as I said, 
I kind of said, I, I hinted at this before, they're mostly young men from somewhat poorer backgrounds, and in the early years, anyway, would not ordinarily, ordinarily have been able to find a place in society, let alone serve the king in a personal capacity. Or, say, the cardinal, who's the most ultimately the most powerful man in France, is the, is the cardinal. He has the political power, and he actually knows what he's doing in terms of statecraft. But, um, and actually, what's kind of funny is, is when you read the books and you, you, and you watch the movies, there's a moment when everybody realizes that Cardinal Richelieu is not actually the bad guy, and he just is doing his best for France, uh, and that opens up the murky world of statecraft in the 17th century. So it, Cardinal Richelieu doesn't want to be king. He's quite happy being who he is, so he's not going to use his guards to, to stage a coup unless the king completely goes off his rocket. Uh, likewise, the king's guard are unlikely to be used as a kind of a Praetorian guard assassination attempt because there's no way at this stage you're going to be able to turn the musketeers against the king. So you mentioned about how, how these men come from a lower echelon of society than um, most people who move in court. How do people get to be a musketeer? What's that kind of selection process like? Well, um, as, as far as I can tell, the best example I can give you would be what Louis XIV looked for in his musketeers, who are a little later on than the first musketeers, but I believe roughly the same rules apply, which was he asked only that his musketeers be men of substance and quality. So in other words, able to maintain himself as a gentleman within the royal guard. Otherwise, there was no actual qualification that the man be of any particular class or indeed quality, although by kind of definition in that time, that meant you were of a certain social standing and they were, uh, because you needed to buy everything but the weapons and their distinctive uniform, uh, which was a cassock uh, at first and then called it, and then simplified into something called the super vest. Um, and so, yeah, only effectively it meant that only sons of gentry and nobility could effectively join the company, and this is especially the case as you go into the 18th century when they become much more elitist in terms of who can join them just because it becomes so much more expensive to become a royal guard. Um, but, um, yeah, at the beginning, certainly, you could be a guy from rural a rural part in France um, who has a good name, and uh, uh, maybe your dad has enough friends to pay for your kit or something like that to get you started, and then your pay would offset the rest um, of your needs essentially. And you th and that would be and you could join the royal guard. And uh, in some units already by this time, certainly by the time of Louis the Fourteenth, um, you had to be of quite good standing, say, to be uh, in the in the guard corps or something like that. Um, so, and that, again, that speaks to the um, to the sort of the, the kind of the, the dedication that they had to the king, because most of the the average musketeer was a teenager when he joined up um, between sixteen and seventeen, and um, uh, from an out and out out of the way family uh, owes everything everything to the king. So if you blend those two together, you have quite a potent thing of, of a small core of young dangerous swordsmen, expert at weapons handling due to their training, ready for anything, and, yeah, ready for anything, to be honest, would have been an apt motto for them, to be honest. Well, take us through that training, then, because, as you say, they, they join up as, with the greatest respect to our teenage listeners, as boys. Mm -hmm. um, because, what are, even if you're 18, I don't care what people say, you're still incredibly <laughs> young as an individual. So what is the training like to give them the discipline to go from being somebody who's up for a fight to somebody who can actually kill a skilled assassin? Well, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. So what's gonna, what they did was they, at first, I don't know how I actually had worked at first, but as time went on, a very close after, I think, the second incarnation of the Musketeers, you get a actual school being um, formed for the Musketeers, uh, by the Musketeer companies. And it kind of becomes a sort of military academy, in a way. It gets the flavor of it, because they're all like young soldiers learning how to be soldiers, kind of thing. Gentlemen, at this time, could already ride, shoot, fence, you know, do all that sort of thing. But to learn the military life, they then had to be told how to use a pike, 
how to work in formations, how to use the musket. Uh, so going through all the drills ordinary infantry and cavalry would go through and rely and just honing those those skills that the nobility were already expected to know, especially if you're a young man. Um, and they probably and, and and what happened was as time went on, older musketeers would take the job of training the younger ones and and so on. And it just sort of helps perpetuate the, the strong traditions of uh, sort of excellent excellence in excellence in arms amongst the regiment. So what role did the musketeers have on the battlefield? Because this is, again, as you've touched on before, an era when kings are still present on the battlefield. You've mentioned how actually some of these kings like to kind of get involved to a greater or lesser extent. So is is this in, at a sufficiently late point where that transition is happening away from kings being in the thick of the fighting? So they're effectively there as an escort. Or do they actually get their hands dirty, if you will, and play a key role? A bit like we see some um, guard units kind of playing an active role as elite troops in battlefields, in battles later on. Mm-hmm. Um, all, always, a, always good questions. There, you are seeing a transition away of, of uh, from from kings actually taking command roles on the field. Because they recognise that that's just a pain in the neck for their generals. Because a king on the field literally outranks everybody else, so he has to actually always be delegating. No, you are in command of this battle, sir. I'm just here because I'm with the army, kind of thing. Louis the Fourteenth did take his role very seriously um, and did go on campaign quite a lot. Louis the Thirteenth also went on campaign with his army um, to fight Protestant rebels and Spanish and things like that. And so it was necessary for the bodyguard to go with him, uh, but also to play an actual combat role. So uh, although you weren't getting kings like 15th and 16th centuries actually either being in danger, in danger of being captured or killed so much, they were in the field and they brought their bodyguards with them. So in the context of conflict, the royal guards existed largely so that an army could rely on a highly motivated and superbly drilled corps of troops that could theoretically win or save a battle if need be. There are many instances of guard units across Europe, like you say, taking appalling casualties during, during battles rather than disgrace their reputation by simply running away. Uh, I don't really do like to do parallels between modern and old-fashioned things very much, but very much throughout the 17th century, the musketeers were kind of as close to a commando team as you could get in this period. Um, They were particularly adept at storming fortifications, although the musketeers were essentially the king's closest bodyguards. Like we've said, they were always a highly effective fighting unit. They were the vanguard in many perilous operations. Um, their first action was apparently the operations on the Ile de Ré during the siege of La Rochelle, um, which was in 1627-1628. Uh, but they, they, their metal was, was fairly rigorously tested when the Duke of Savoy's troops blocked the Pass de Seuss in 1629, refusing the French army passage to reach the Spanish uh, who, you know, Louis the Thirteenth decided he needed to fight. And Louis decided to storm the fortifications, and the column, one of the columns, was headed by the musketeers, and they rushed up the slopes of a very formidable position uh, and broke through the barricades at sword point. They were orda- very audacious in attack, therefore, but pretty tenacious in defence as well. And you see that in the Battle of the Dunes in 1659, when the musketeers repulsed apparently four cavalry charges from the Spanish. And during the wars of the Louis XIV, the musketeers were, were again, very active um, because Louis XIV liked to travel with the army. Uh, in 1667, the, these young psychos were... Uh, uh, time, huh? Yeah, highly motivated madmen um, <laughs> mounted the fortifications of Lille in under 15 minutes and the town uh, capitulated the next day. And the governor was absolutely floored to find out that most of his conquerors were like all adolescent boys. Um, in an infantry role, the musketeers developed as, like just there were superb shock troops, you know, during sieges. They 
like I told you before, <laughs> Captain Lieutenant D'Artagnan, he was very old by the time he died at Maastricht. He was still leading for the front, storming fortifications like he was just a teenage boy, uh, because that's the reputation of the regiment. You know, the, the Dutch must have learned to, to fear the sight of these blue tabards coming at them, because it would signal basically an unstoppable onrush of a pack of merciless killers. They, I mean, they cleared, they cleared the way before the rest of the army getting into these fortresses at uh, Besançon in 1674 and Condé 1676. And then there comes the cream of the crop, the most ridiculous story you'll hear of, 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 of these guys, which is uh, Valenciennes in 1677. No forlorn hope was complete without the musketeers. The French called these things les enfants perdus, the lost children. Right. But after the storm of Valenciennes, if the musketeers were part of it, this, this was not a forlorn hope or lost children. It was just something to avoid. You had to get out of the way of this. So leading the assault of the outwork in the town, the musketeers overcame, as they usually did, the fortifications they targeted, supported by other guard regiments and apparently that of the Picardy regiment. And having gained the objective, the musketeers happened to see that there were some gates in front of them through which the enemy were retreating. They decided to rush these alone, and they pierced the main walls by these gates, fought their way through the posterns and through these gates, and then, and then when the counterattack inevitably came, they didn't run away, they just, they just stuffed themselves into little bolt holes and, and little alleyways and held the gates until the rest of the army could get them, get through. And they did, and the governor was forced to surrender once the rest of the army got through. So this is what we're dealing with here. I mean, there's, there's more as well. It's like they have reputed at the Battle of Castle in the field. The musketeers dismounted, which is actually a very pertinent thing about how they fought. Um, and hacked their way through the, the Prince of Orange's infantry, which had been just immovable for the, the rest of the day. Um, and uh, they were so audacious and so almost uncontrollable by this point that in one battle, um, I think in, in, in 1691, they, they seemed to feel they were like, like guards because they had to be told to stay in line that if any of them stepped out of line, it was the duty of their officers to shoot them dead, to try and restrain them <laughs> from going into action. So, you know, this is the, this is this is their glory days. You know, um, they they had a tougher time against Marlborough, although you know the guard cavalry did kind of save the day at Udinade, um, and they did have some revenge at Montplaquet. Uh, but you cannot overestimate what these guys could do at the, at the height of their powers in, under Louis XIV. Are you sure there's no substance abuse going on here to get them into that kind of mental state? I really don't know. I mean, there's, there's talk in the 17th century about people like, you know, getting their, guy, getting their troops drunk, but the musketeers seem to do it sober and drunk, drink afterwards. But musketeers just be really hard to kill. You know, even even in De at the Battle of Dettingen in 1743, the, I mean, the French lost this battle. Many musketeers were ruined financially because they lost so much of their equipment and their horses because they were still paying for the, most of their equipment by this point, and it was very expensive. <laughs> well, there's one account of a guy called Marshal de Logis Bessie who took 15 sabre cuts to kill, and Apparently, the Duke of Cumberland was so impressed by the musketeers that, although he had been slightly wounded at Dettingen, he ordered his surgeon to see to the wounds of the musketeers first that had been captured because he had been so impressed by them. And, uh, you know, the, uh, their last hurrah in battle was like in 1745, 1746, around Fontenoy and stuff like that. But uh, when the last, uh, that was when the kings of France stopped actively going to war. So, I mean, do what you want with this. Do what you want with this, because it, it's pretty hard to believe, but apparently it's, it's, it's something, it's the musketeers.
I'm I'm convinced they must have been smoking something, frankly. (laughs) This just doesn't make any sense. 15 sabre cuts to take down a guy. Yeah. If you came near me with a sword, I'd run away screaming like a child. (laughs) Not not if you're a musketeer. (laughs) musketeer. So what happens to them in the long run? Where do they kind of disappear from history? Having sort of come out with a with a with a bang and a growl and uh, all this craziness, they kind of go away quite quietly, and it's all to do with bureaucracy and the, and the failing state of the royal French ancien regime. To be honest, um, in seventeen in the seventeen seventies, Louis the Sixteenth was forced to reduce the size of the royal guard, which had grown into an overly flamboyant and ridiculously expensive bloat on the treasury. To drain this, the less senior cavalry regiments were disbanded. And this included the Musketeers, who were disbanded in 1776, I think. Um, uh, by the time of 1789, only the Garde du Corps, the Garde Francais, and the Garde Suisse were still in the service. And of those, only the Swiss stayed loyal when the revolution came, and with the majority of them dying in defense of the Tuileries in 1792. And, you know, one can only wonder... If, if maybe the king and his family might have been able to escape his fate if the traditionally die-hard musketeers had been retained. But uh, because even in the 18th century, the motto emblazoned on the, fa- on the flag of the first company, it, it, and forgive my Latin here, I'm sorry guys, which is something like quo ruit et lectum, which, my, which a, good, a friend of mine, Professor Llewellyn Morgan, tells me on Twitter, means with a death also rushes. So, in other words, we go with a death also rushes. We chase death, basically. <laughs> um, uh, I, I go where death goes. The company was reformed with the first Bourbon restoration with some truly exceptional examples of military tailoring uh, to wear in 1814. And a few of them accompanied Louis uh, the 18th to Ghent in 1815, but it, but they were so expensive that it again that it was sadly disbanded at the end of 1815. Otherwise, they might have become the musketeers of the Republican Guard by now. I don't know, um, or something. And and rank as one of the oldest guard institutions in Europe today. It's effectively, what we might be able to say is that because of the musketeers being disbanded we ended up with Napoleon. And oh, yes. therefore yes. I've managed to shoehorn <laughs> the Napoleonic Wars into this episode and Alex is genuinely going to kill me for it. So I'm not even sorry. <laughs> Josh, this has been absolutely brilliant. Um, I know you've got a couple of books out. Remind people about where they can get them. Well, we should say they can get them from the bookstore, but tell them about... Mm. You have uh, one out on Wild East and another is out soon on the, the Indian yes. campaigns. Yes, uh, Wild East, British in Japan, uh, which is a lot of uh, Victorian daring do and, and uh, people getting confused about diplomacy and gunboat diplomacy and things like that in Japan. It's what the British were doing in Japan. It's a terribly niche subject. Um, so, you know, if you're into that, you can get that on Amazon uh, from, you know, uh, or from Font Hill, or from Font Hill Media's website. Um, or, better still, it will be in our bookstore. Alex will give you the details in just a second because she's really good with that stuff. And you can uh, buy the book, but at the same time, you can support us because we will get 10% of the sales from that. And we'll put the link in the description or below if you're watching this on YouTube or, or whatever. Look in the, the um, descriptor and we'll give you the link. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so that's Wild East. Um, the second book, my second ever book, uh, which is, is, is the title is A Bullock's Grain and Good Madeira, which is the Maratha and Jat campaigns, 1803 to 1806, is at this moment, I believe, being copy edited to be published, I think, later this month, and I'm sure it will be out by May. So uh, that will be available through Helium and Company. Uh, and again, on Amazon. George, this has been brilliant. Thanks very much. Thank you. All, all for one and one for all. All for one and one for all.
Don't forget that we do exist on Patreon as History Hack and on Patreon as well, which is Podbean's own version. Uh, Alina and I have had massive fun doing this in 2020, uh, but life's going to change quite a lot next year and we're going to actually have to go and earn a living, etc. If we want to keep up the regularity that we've been bringing you and the kind of guests that we've been bringing you and the workload, then we will need your help. So uh, if you join... There's going to be incentives for joining on either of those platforms. We're revamping ourselves on both of them. So don't forget to go in. You can do as little as a dollar a month and it all goes towards keeping up History Hack as regular as we've been able to bring it to you this year. When our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book, the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them, and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash hack history, or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support, and here's to your next great book.